My name is Tino, and I'm an agriculture engineer. Obviously, at some point, I wanted to study agriculture. Uh, but by the time I uh, graduated, I had a different wish. I wanted for myself not to be involved with agriculture. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. It was so messy, it was uh, illogical, violent, uh, it was utterly unsustainable. But after a few decades, I came around. Because the 21st century actually gave us tools to make the way that we produce food change in a completely uh, big way. I will talk about food production, how it began, where it is today, and where it just might take us in the future. Food production started about 23,000 years ago when people started uh, deli um, deliberately planting, planting seeds. Uh, people stopped uh, hunting and gathering long enough to plant a garden. It wasn't much, it was just to fulfill their own needs, to feed oneself and a family. It was later, about 12,000 years ago, uh, where commercial uh, farming actually began, when people started exchanging produce, ones that they had plenty of, for others that they didn't have enough of. But that sti still didn't boost the production, because whatever we produced, we had to consume. It was about 5,000 years ago when everything changed. At that time, we invented currency. In Mesopotamia, we invented currency, and it was inevitably the first time humans could generate and accumulate profit. And this profound change will later change the face of the planet. Fast forward a couple of millennia, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, humans are currently farming 2 billion ruminants, 3 billion ruminants, I'm sorry, 1 billion pigs, 30 billion chickens, and producing 1 metric ton of, uh, 1 billion metric tons of vegetables, the same amount of fruit, and about 2 billion metric tons of grain. That altogether comes to about 5 billion tons of food per year. If we would divide this among the population of the planet, every single woman, man and child would get 1.7 kilograms of food per day. So how is it that food is still uh, occasionally scarce, that the cost of food is going up, and there, there's even famine in some parts of the world? Something just doesn't add up. So let's quickly go through a production cycle of a vegetable, for example. So, the farmer grows vegetables on a farm. When it's ripe, he, pack it, he transports, this, transports the vegetable to the packaging plant. Of course, not all the vegetable makes it, because some vegetables are, do not uh, uh, fit to the required form, or they're not pretty enough. So, some of it is wasted. At the production plant, at the packaging plant, uh, of course, packages have to be specifically weighed and sized, and part of the vegetables don't make the cut there either. So, they're tossed away, also, some of it. Then, the next journey takes them to the wholesale central warehouse, where it sits and waits for the retail store to need it. That can take a few days, and some of the vegetables don't make it, and some packaging gets uh, damaged. So we lose a little bit there. Finally, the retail store gets the, the veggies, they come onto the shelf, and the customers take it off, sh off, the shelf during the, off the shelves during the day, and the staff restocks the shelves continuously. But at the end of the day, what is left is tossed away. So, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, approximately 14% of all food produced is lost between harvest and the retail store. Another 17% of all the food is lost at the retailer level and the consumer level. In total, this comes to approximately 1.3 billion tons a year. Not rotten food, not food gone bad. We are talking nutritious, normal food, wasted. And that's not the end of the story. Because the food turns to waste, it still has to be managed as waste. 
and waste management is getting more and more expensive and more and more complex. So the farmer is under, there's a big problem for the farmer, but also for the consumer, because the farmer must produce more and more, because we waste more. And the consumer has to pay more, because somebody's got to pay for the food that was produced and invested into and then thrown away. And then on top of all this, the environment, environmental issue with all of this. The hyperproduction of food created enormous uh, application of pesticides, greenhouse gases, production of greenhouse gases, and through plastic uh, waste through from plastic packaging. And the 21st century accelerated all these processes uh, more than any other era in human history. So, what can we do about it? All big change in a free market can and must be started by, in one place, from the consumer himself. And this change must start with the way consumers eat and the way consumers shop. When talking about eating habits, I can't remember, I can't uh, not remember my mother telling me, you know, you have to eat what, way, what I cook for you. And it was, uh, that seemed very unfair to me. You know, I was looking at the greens, at the broccoli, and it was just not fair. But today, we could find a lot of wisdom in that. Because in our uh, need to provide everything for everybody at any given time, we are bound to hyperproduce. We, we create enormous quantities of food. And of course, a lot of it is wasted. If we had our mothers tell us, eat what is available and what is uh, reasonable at a certain time, a huge part of our problem would disappear. If we got a de delivery from f f uh, fresh produce, for example, from our gar uh, own garden, for example, we would probably eat it. We wouldn't throw one third away and just buy some new food. That would be illogical. So we would maybe despite our wishes, we would use what we have. And this is the moment where change begins, with sustainability. We need a way to make the consumer commit to changing his eating habits. We need the consumer to subscribe to a different way of getting and consuming food. But changing habits, of course, uh, is not easy but we have found ways to do it. One very specific way is through psychological benefits of subscriptions. A subscription is a commitment to consume some goods or services in the future by paying for them now and periodically through the period. Such a simple commitment can uh, begin making significant changes in customer behavior and enables the customer to easy, easily follow his plan uh, without uh, being forced to uh, handle day-to-day real-time decisions that are sometimes very hard to make. Reports by Forbes show that subscription-based businesses have grown 100% per year every year for the last five years. And this growth is, deeply, uh, is, is driven by deeply rooted psychological benefits of subscriptions. These are convenience, anticipation, and control. Convenience is one of the biggest drivers of subscri subscriptions. Uh, according to a dual process theory by Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman of Princeton, we use two cognitive systems uh, to make decisions. One is uh, our gut instinct, and the other is our rational deliberation. And we use this dual system when making strategies or plans, but also when shopping. And the, 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 the characteristic of the subscription model is that it kind of overbridges this system and makes it easier to come to a decision, and much more interesting, it enables us not to have to make decisions in the future on the same topic. It, the decision at one point is made for us for a longer period of time. So 
if we want to create change in the future, we can do it now and not worry about it tomorrow. Another psychological effect of the subscription model is anticipation. When customers subscribe to a product or a service they, they really like, they can enjoy the anticipation on a, regul, on a, on a uh, repeating schedule. So it's like uh, getting a gift from yourself. Even if you paid for it, you're looking forward to it. And maybe the most important fe feature of a subscription is control. The consumer or subscriber, in fact, has control of his future actions. So by setting up a subscription today to, for example, eat specific food or not eat specific food in the future, he can directly influence his decisions and develop new eating habits. With these effects provided, uh, without these effects provided from a subscription-based system, for example, it is very, very, very hard to change customer behavior. Many global movements have tried this in different ways uh, to save our own or the health of the planet, but the results are lacking. So what if we consider using subscription models in the same approach? Let's imagine you could subscribe for something as a meatless Monday. And you could just uh, subscribe to have uh, one plant-based meal every Monday for the next month or a year. And you pay for it. What, are the, what is the probability that you would consume this uh, plant-based meal? I would say it's rather high. So in this way, we enable us to mm, hold on to our uh, wished program without the risk of deciding otherwise along the way. So, we change our eating habits. How does that help the planet? It actually helps quite a lot. As you have probably heard, there is one thing that can change whole industries, and that is the consumer. It doesn't sound likely, it might sound impossible from the point, viewpoint of a consumer, but it's actually so. Uh, by changing our preferences, we change industries. This is why nobody sells wooden shoes anymore. Car radios, uh, car phones, transistor radios. We stopped wanting them, the industry stopped making them. So what is it that we could achieve by changing our eating habits? What problems are we trying to solve? To answer this, I would like to introduce you to the three enemies of the 21st century. It's food waste, plastic packaging waste, and pesticides. Regarding the 1.3 billion tons of food that we waste, imagine all citizens of a city, consumers, have subscribed uh, to receive a certain amount and assortment of produce directly from a farmer in advance, long-term subs subscription. And the farmer knows exactly what they need, uh, when they need it, and he delivers it directly to the consumers. So nothing is wasted. Especially if our mother, mothers play this role again and tell us, you know, eat what is reasonable and what is available, we could actually save a little part of the 1.3 billion tons of food that is normally wasted, and we wouldn't have to sac sacrifice much. I live, in a, in a, I live in a city of a million people, a bit more than 200,000 households. And my community is testing this subscription, this subscription theory. The preliminary results after two years show that only if 1% of the households commits to such a subscription, we could save 50 tons of fresh produce yearly, enough to feed 100 families throughout the year. And that's 1% of the households. Imagine multiple cities doing it. Imagine countries doing it. To plastic packaging. Is there a need for excessive packaging of your vegetable if it's coming from a nearby source? Do you need multiple layers of plastic on your tomato? Would you mind uh, getting it in a uh, reusable wooden uh, uh, packaging? Probably not. 
According to a survey by Ipsos, uh, in European countries, 93% of all citizens prefer paper than plastic, and most of them agree that even if it's less convenient, they would choose paper and not plastic. And last but not least, pesticides. Organic farming, other than saving our health, are crucial for saving the soil, the underground water, uh, and, of course, the, the, the environment itself. Uh, the U.S. National Institute of Health uh, prove, has proven that se uh, pesticides have serious health implications to man and, he and uh, his environment. There is now overwhelming, overwhelming evidence uh, that some of these uh, chemicals do pose a potential risk to uh, humans, other life, and uh, uh, side, they um, cause unwanted side effects in the environment. So now we know that there is a good reason and good foundation to battle food waste, packaging waste, and to support organic agriculture. Maybe by engaging in long-term planning, maybe through a food subscription platform. But why isn't it happening? It's simple. We don't contemplate the future of the world uh, when buying cucumbers. So even in the, in the organic aisle, we always weigh the additional cost of organic uh, produce against the conventional one, even if we know for a fact that it's not good for us and not good for the environment. Humans are creatures of habit, and breaking habits is hard work. Today, we rely on marketing um, and education to drive consumer, consumer behavior. Uh, we use government incentives and innovative uh, business models to change the existing, existing agriculture models. But what if, by applying subscription models to the main food production, we could, in time, feed more hungry people, start saving money, and stop piling up huge mountains of pasty garbage around our cities. We could make farming more profitable, and our lives would improve because of better nutrition. Subscription is planning, and planning is the best way to a favorable outcome. And we could really use a favorable outcome. Thank you.